what are the different conditions so I'll give you some hint so if someone is on some arrhythmia then we have to start then similarly someone has undergone some procedures as well so for example after the Uh, so someone is having a deep vein thrombosis so that is again a time when you all should be starting someone on anticoagulation right so even for the anticoagulation a lot of changes has been going on so initial the classical ones were like warfarin acinocumarol but nowadays we are also using something is called as the newer anticoagulants what is called as the NOAX new oral anticoagulants so let's try to go through that. As I was telling, the classical ones are the warfarins. So the reason why they are used is quite a lot. So they are used to prevent coagulation. Of course, if the clots are already formed, so you are trying to dissolve them, or you are also trying to prevent the bleeding and hemorrhages. And you, if there's already a deficiency of those factors you're trying to overcome that so we need to understand how the blood clot is formed so there are three phases for that a vascular phase platelet phase and a coagulation phase and of course finally a fibrinolytic phase in the initial vascular phase there's something called as vasoconstriction during which there is an exposure to the tissues which tends to activate the tissue factor and it tends to initiate the coagulation and then the platelet phage is activated and during which what is going to happen is the endothelial cells tend to prevent the platelet adhesion and aggregation and then the platelets that contain the receptors for fibrinogen and one that is what is called as the VW factor as well and it tends to happen after the vessel injury and after that there will be release of the permeability factor which will be further promoting the coagulation and finally comes the coagulation phase which is again divided into the two pathways what is called as the intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway and they, both of them they do have a common point and in fact 13 soluble factors are involved in clotting and the biosynthesis are dependent on the vitamin k1 and vitamin k2 and normally which are inactive and if they have to get activated they get activated in sequence wise and if they are absent especially since birth that is the condition which is called as hemophilia and as I was telling you those two complementary pathways which are present the intrinsic one the extrinsic one so intrinsic one what happens is all those clotting factors are there within the blood however for the extrinsic pathway the initiating factor is outside the blood vessel like the tissue factors and the extrinsic pathway is always faster so which just takes like a few seconds and if you want to measure those extrinsic pathway that is when you try to do is what is called as prothrombin test however for the intrinsic pathway you try to do is activated partial thromboplasty in time so APTT and PT, they are different tests. They are trying to measure different parameters as well. They are trying to check for the different factors as well. This is the overall pathway. As you may see on the screen, if there is a blood vessel injury or a tissue injury, the, the, how these different pathways are getting activated one leading to the another one and finally of course the fibrin polymer is getting formed so what are the other anticoagulants which you all know of 
which is being used for preventing thromboembolism. So warfarin, we already said it. it. Its main action is to decrease the synthesis of clotting factors. It's mainly used to prevent venous thrombosis. Similarly, heparin is also another anticoagulant which is given parenterally and uh, this is again also used for prevent venous thrombosis. Similarly, what about aspirin? Aspirin is mainly used for arterial thrombosis, isn't it? And it tends to inhibit platelet aggregation. So the mechanism of action is quite a lot different. What about the streptokinase, which is used for thrombolysis? Rather than thrombolysis, actually it should be called as fibrinolysis. Because why? Hey, Sister, what do you see in the file? What do you see in the file? Vibhas Tanwar. Dr. Vibhas Tanwar, I can hear you. Please mute your microphone. Okay. Now coming to the heparin. So heparin, what is the special thing about it? The thing is, it should always be given only intravenous or subcutaneous. You should never give IM injection. Okay. Similarly, you must be monitor the half-life like every uh, yeah the average half-life is almost one to five hours and if you want to monitor the action of the heparin you should try to do a test what is the test for that does anyone remember that so the test is called as aptt and the as we all know the antidote for this drug is called as protamin so this is how the heparin acts. So, I think I think everyone is already uh, using these other oral anticoagulants as well, like the Comarin, Dicumarol. So they are very much structurally related to the vitamin K, which tends to inhibit production of active clotting factors. The clear the clearance is slow, uh, nearly like thirty six hours. And the onset may be delayed like 8 to 12 hours. And if you want to, if there is an overdose, how will you reverse its action? So, if you want to reverse its action, you can try to use this vitamin K infusion. And the one must, one really important thing, one which we all need to keep in our mind is as they may cross the placenta you must not use them during the late stages of the pregnancy so as you can see in this diagram very clearly how the oxidization of the vitamin k is happening so it is mediated by the d descarboxy prothrombin uh, getting converted into prothrombin and that is why this mechanism everything is happening in the liver okay So whenever you are using warfarin, so what are the various side effects? It's very simple to think about it, right? So the common side effects can be is bleeding, bleeding from the rectum, black stool, or bleeding can literally happen from everywhere. So that's why rash, itching, even someone can have a chest pain nausea, vomiting, fever, or flu-like symptoms as well, or even diarrhea, or difficulty in moving, in fact, as well can happen. And for men, it can be even more problematic in the sense of having painful erections, actually. So one of the things I really would like to say, a lot of times whenever you are starting warfarin in a patient, the patient, uh, a lot of those warfarin patients tend to develop dementia, especially in AF patients. And you know what is the reason for that? So it tends to hap happen as something is called as multiple microhemorrhages. Microhemorrhages in the sense they may not be able to detect on the MRI. But those hemorrhages are happening. They are very large in number but they all are very small to be detected enough. And that is one which leads to memory loss. So there are some other less common side effects as well, which tend can happen. 
in the form of fatigue, pale skin, otherwise there may be hair loss or even acidity as well. And then similarly, uh, uh, yeah, whenever you are using warfarin, the drug interaction can happen quite a lot. So what are the drugs which can affect its uh, dosage or uh, uh, about its serum level as well. So what happens is there are some drugs which can increase the warfarin activity. So what are those drugs? So what, what is happening is some of those drugs may decrease its binding to albumin. So like aspirin, sulfonamides, Okay, but similarly, some of the drugs may uh, increase its uh, yeah serum levels by inhibiting its degradation. For example, like cimetidine disulfiram. However, there are some drugs like antibiotics or oral antibiotics, which tend to decrease the synthesis of clotting factors. So that's why, so similarly, if you're trying to use warfarin with aspirin or heparin and metabolites, of course, the chances of bleeding will be higher. Similarly, if you are trying to use it with barbiturates or even cholestyramine as well, it is going to decrease the warfarin activity. Similarly, and what are the other commonly used antiplatelet drugs? Does anyone remember? So I think someone is watching nice television and we can hear the television audio. Waris, please mute your microphone. Yeah. So, um, what are the other antiquated drugs you all are aware of? Clopidogrel. Nice uh, and? Uh, nice. Great, Srividya. Nice and? Ticlopidin, aspirin. So how they act is they tend to prevent the platelet aggregation or the adhesion. That's why they are used mostly for arterial thrombosis. For example, in case of myocardial infarction, stroke, or heart valve replacements as well. And their mechanism of action is they tend to inhibit the COX enzyme, cyclooxygenase, which is a key enzyme which is involved in the synthesis of thromboxin 2. So what is the prophylactic usage of aspirin? And as I said it, they tend to prevent the ischemic attack, which is in the form of mini stroke and myocardial infarction. And it is, uh, yeah, you should, ideally you should not give it to people who have deficiency of this enzyme, what is called as glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. In fact, so what is going to happen is they will be having problems with the Metabolism actually. So that is why you should avoid it. So if you may be able to understand what I'm talking about is the mechanism of action of all these drugs is different. So that is why you should not so for example if it is arterial thrombosis it is different. It is venous thrombosis it is different. But if you are trying to do a fibrinolysis fibrins are there you are trying to break it together it is different. Okay, so that's why that is the basic mechanism why all these things are different and you need to be aware of those things. That what is being used for what purpose actually. Okay, so as I was telling you fibrinolysis, so fibrinolysis as you know, so what you try to use is streptokinase. But streptokinase is a bacterial product and that is why when you will be using it, Sometimes you may also get immune reactions. However, when you try to use a human tissue derived urokinase, you may not come across such problems. 
Similarly, when you are trying to use a tissue plasminogen activator, which is a genetically cloned product, you will not gain get any immune reaction at all. However, it can be very expensive. So, so what are the oral preparations which is available? So there are not a lot many. Uh, so in the oral preparations, you may also use this. Uh, as I had already said, the warfarin is there, or those percentin as well. However, for parenteral use, heparin is being used. Okay, and for the clots, as I had added, already said it, streptokinase, urokinase, altiplase, tenecteplase as well. Then vitamin K, we all know, uh, the which can, in, can be in the form of phytonadion, so which is vitamin K1. So it is available in form of 5 milligram tablets. And then, yes, you may also use plasma fractions for hemophilia. Similarly, if someone is deficient in factor 9 complex or other factors, you must be able to supplement them. And then, a um, lot of times, uh, people, they ask, can we do the home monitoring for these kind of products? It's not always advisable, unless until there is a rare case. Why? The reason is because standardization of these tests can be a big problem in the form of uses of INR or these kind of tests, which is called as coagulant check. So there are these kits are available, but they may not always be so much reliable. So that is why uh, it is always preferred for hospital monitoring. Have you all? Are you all aware of NOAX? So what is NOAX? Give me some example. So NOAX actually stands for New Oral Anticoagulants, especially compared to the conventional vitamin K antagonists for thromboembolic prevention. So the big advantage for them is not only pre predictable effect without any need for monitoring, but also there are fewer food and drug interactions. They are much more predictable half-life if an elimination as well. Similarly, no acts which are approved or under evaluation for systemic embolism or stroke in patients with non valvular AF. So there are plenty of them which is available right now for their usage like dabigatron, apixaban, edoxaban, rivaroxaban. And the classical dosage of dabigatron is 110 150 milligram but you have to use it bd so as you may see for apixaban or even edoxaban as well apixaban is again bd however edoxaban or rivaroxaban is only od dosage dabigatron some of the biggest study um, for dabigatron came in the form of rely trial and uh, especially uh, based in South Asia, you may be coming across soon, Dabigatron is going out of out of uh, patent rule. So what may happen may happen soon is you'll be coming across a lot of cheap variants of Dabigatron as well. So always one of the practical question comes is what about the practical startup and the follow-up scheme? which should be followed for patients on NOAX. So we need to first of all understand is a NOAX indicated or not. Then you have to also consider what about those co-medications if someone is taking. Especially proton pump inhibitors. They should be advised so as to reduce the risk for gastrointestinal bleeding. And it is always better that all the NOAX patients should carry information card so that if there is some problem, 
the attending physician should be able to know about it. So as now coming towards the indication, these uh, drugs are used for plenty of conditions. And how they are used is again very important. So for example, in cases of DVT, which I was saying, so if you're trying to use warfarin, you should be able to maintain a INR of 2.5 and you should use it for minimum of three months. Similarly, when you're just trying to use it for the pro prophylaxis of venous thromboembolism, you may consider dabigatrin or even rivaroxaban as well. And especially for the patients after total hip replacement or total knee replacement surgery, again, they can be used as well. But dabigatrin, you can start within immediately one to four hours of surgery and continue minimum at least for 10 days after knee replacement and 28 to 35 days after the hip replacement. So for hip replacement, almost for one whole month you have to use. Similarly, river oxaban has to be started within six hours, but up to five weeks. And for the apixaban, as well, almost similar number of days. And when someone has had a recurrence of deep vein thrombosis, you have to increase the INR of warfarin, so which will go up to 3.5, and the dosage, the duration is going to be possible lifelong. So if there is a patient of mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation, and ha this patient is having AF, or systemic embolism, left atrial thrombus, or even an enlarged left atrium, you have to use warfarin with a target INR of 2.5. Similarly, if there is a patient with inherited thrombophilia, the warfarin INR range should be 2.5. Even for, some, same thing applies for the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, so which is called as P. N H. AF we all know, you all should always try to calculate is chance of S2 scoring and then on the basis of that you can try to use. Similarly if there is a patient of cardioversion then same thing applies as well and ideally three weeks before the cardioversion and four weeks after the cardioversion as well, you should try to use. Can anyone mention what is the reason for that? Why before cardioversion actually? And four weeks after cardioversion, why? So what happens is, because whenever you are trying to give a shot, then whatever thrombus or embolus may be there, it is going to emboli to the brain. So that's why it can cause problems and similarly, so whenever you do a cardioversion, so the heart is going to be in the form of a myocardial stunning, it is called as cardiac stunning. So that is the reason. To, so you want to prevent those complications. And the other common indications are mural thrombus, dilated cardiomyopathy, arterial grafts, coronary thrombosis, and also artificial valves. So this is a standard chart which has been proposed by the EHRA, European Heart Rhythm Association. They are very simple to use, very like uh, patient friendly as well. They don't need any technical training to be used. So uh, this is how they can be used. So how once if you have started a patient on those drugs, how do you do the follow-up for those ones? So, you can do is, uh, you have to, those patients ideally do follow up with a specialist or a general physician who has experience in that field. So once, as I said, it, so this is a flowchart which summarizes how you should do the follow-up. 
So once you have started them, you can do the first follow up after one month. In the meantime, you have to check for the compliance, any thromboembolic events, bleeding events are there, or the side effects are there. How about those co medications? Is the patient just taking? Or is there any need for blood sampling? And then after that, you also try to see is as I said so this is literally like a table which you can try to see in the terms of for example whenever you do a blood sampling you should try to see for simple things like hemoglobin renal and liver functions the how much is the creatinine clearance for the patient as well is there any bleeding any somewhere else as well is are they really taking it good enough or not especially if a patient is on dabigatran you must check the renal functions so for example like has it gone down or something if it is going down you must stop it as well and then how are you going to measure the anticoagulant effect is it possible to measure the NOAX? NOAX, as we all know, within three hours of administration, you will see the maximum effect. And you can check it. But not all the tests can be used for everything. In the sense, the APTT, APTT, which stands for Activated Thromboplastin Time, can be used for Qualitative assessment of dabigatran, however, the sensitivity varies. Similarly, there is also a test what is called as hemoclot, diluted thrombo, thrombin time, DTT, hemoclot. It's a, this is one of the advantages compared to, so for example, a lot of times, no, people may ask, what is the unique advantage of these different types of these NOACs? For example, for diluted DTT, as I said it, when you use a hemoclot, it will give you a predictive, quantitative assessment of dabigatran. But yes, there's no uh, cutoff value on which surgery is safe, actually. And then you can also always do a factor 10 a chromogenic assay. So yes, commercially it is available, but there's no data to associate the level with bleeding or thromboembolic risk. Are you all able to see this slide now on your screen? So this is a wonderful. Yes, sir. Yeah. So Sudhir, what do you, Doctor Sudhir, what do you see on this screen? So what are the biggest advantages of dabigatran compared to rivaroxaban? Anyone? So what is the biggest uh, sir, action time two hours okay after ingestion i know you can you know how to read read english especially you can read from the slide but what was my question was what are the advantages okay okay i'll tell you i'll tell you so what happens is if you can see these slides very well so what happens is one of the most common side effect with dabigatran is gastritis. However, with rivaroxaban, what happens is the peak level tends to happen a little bit longer after dabigatran. Okay. Then after that, what tends to happen is, as you may see over here uh, in this slide very beautifully, APTT can be used for dabigatran plasma level analysis, but not a fixed ratio is there. Then between fact uh, between prothrombin and factor 10A inhibitor, which is like a rivaroxaban, there's not such a curvilinear ratio between the prothrombin time and the rivaroxaban serum levels. So then comes this drug-to-drug -drug 
interactions as you may see so what happens is the bioavailability of dabigatran is not so high that is why you have to give a dosage of like 110 milligram or 150 milligram actually however for rivaroxaban the bioavailability without food is almost 67 percent and with food if you take it's almost more than 80 percent and then this is another very important slide very very important slide as you may see davicatron is available in the form of a pro drug and in fact the non renal clearance is the least over here and the liver metabolism is very high for rivaroxaban and then as we had said it rivaroxaban if you take it after the food the bioabsorption tends to increase however for dabigatran it's not much the effect is very minimal and in fact dabigatran when you try to see in terms of asian ethnicity it has shown that the plasma levels tend to be almost 25 percent higher and as i said it one of the most common side effect with dabigatran is gastritis so you must be able to take care for its common side effect so there are different uh, safety protocols which is being used for the noax so how are they used is as you may see especially for its interaction in the sense when you try to take dabigatran with atorvastatin it may raise its serum level by almost 20 percent however for river oxaban there's no interaction at all similarly if you're trying to take these drugs especially dabigatran with dronedron or these antifungal agents the serum level may change quite a lot similarly even for antibiotics as rifampicin or carbamazepine or phenytoin or phenobarbital as well there can be increased by your availability of these drugs so that's why you have to be really careful in what conditions are you using especially for the river oxaban its interaction can be quite a lot so you also have to be a little bit careful what kind of drugs are you using if you are using if if the patient is already on a verapamil if the patient is on quinidine or amidron or dronedron as well as i said it it will change up to 60 percent 65 percent higher as well so similarly even the age itself can also increase the bleeding risk so as you may also see if there is a patient someone more than 80 years they are at higher risk for this similarly a lot of times a common question comes is how to switch over between <coughs> anticoagulants dr squat please mute your microphone okay so if someone is on vitamin k antagonist and you're thinking to switch over to noac you should try to see for the ina if the INR is less than 2, immediately you can switch. However, if the INR is between 2 to 2.5, you can switch immediately or wait till the next day. However, if the INR is more than 2.5, then use INR and oral vitamin K antagonist till the time the INR drops less than 2.5. 
So if someone is on parenteral anticoagulant and you want to switch over to NOAC, what you should do? So for example, for this, initially, start once the unfractionated heparin has been discontinued. And maybe a little bit longer if some there's a patient with renal impairment. Similarly, if someone is already on NOAC, but if you want to switch over to vitamin carotenoids, so what you can do is you can give both these drugs at the same time. And yeah, uh, you can continue till the INR has got into the appropriate range. And then you can measure the INR just before the next intake of the NOAC. And then again retest after 24 hours of the last dose of NOAC. So, if already someone is a NOAC and you are trying to convert to parenteral anticoagulant, then what you do is initiate when next dose of NOAC is due. Then what are you going to do if there is a from one NOAC to another NOAC you are trying to convert? Any suggestions? Ha, Amit ji, bolye. Ha, ha, ha. Discharge ligya. Aray, baap re. Ab ye to hai. Ye to terrible hai. Ab kya kaha jai? This is very unfortunate. Kyunki... Hello, Dr. Narendra. Ha, ha. Uh, doctor, uh, I think your voice was not audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting for the response. Just a second. Because I, I need... Okay, okay. Ju ju just a second. Just a second. I'm getting a telephone call. That's why I had muted. Just a second, please. So, did you all understand? I hope you all understood my question. So, what was my question actually? So, my question was, when you are thinking of switching from one NOAC to another NOAC, what are you going to do? So, I'll just take a two minutes break in the meantime. You all have to discuss and think and you have to answer me, okay? Just two minutes break right now. तो ये लोग अभी अभी जस्ट लेके निकल गया कहाँ एडमिट कहाँ 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 जाके एडमिट हुआ मेदांता अरे बाप रे बाप नहीं अब ये तो अगर किसी को भी बुरा तो लगेगा ही ना हम्म या चलिए नेवर माइंड ठीक ना चलिए ठीक हाँ हाँ या चलिए ठीक है आ आई कम सून ओवर देयर हाँ 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 जरूर 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 ठीक हाँ 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 आई वाज हैविंग माय लंच सो आई कम सून ठीक है मैं आता हूँ ठीक हाँ हाँ ओके ओके थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू Hello. So, did you all read about it actually? How are you going to switch over between no acts to no acts? So the thing is, a lot of times, as I said it, so one of the most, hello, I, I hope everyone is able to hear me. Yes, Dr. Garendra. Yeah. So, as I was telling, so what happens is whenever you are trying to use dabigatran, what may happen is if someone is getting gastritis. So you must be able to 
and if the patient is really symptomatic you will have to consider changing the medicine similarly if someone is having a renal failure then you must again have to think about the changing and how are you going to change that so that is when we all need to know about these points so what is happening is how uh, uh, I'll come with those points one after the other what is really happening is immediately within 12 to 24 hours the anticoagulant effect tends to drop rapidly so that's why it is very important how uh, or how do you ensure the compliance is there for the drug intake in fact so you must always not only teach the patient but also try to involve the family members and you need to be able to console them you need to take them into confidence as well and then you can also form a team of nurse uh, involve the nurses involve the educators you may also involve if possible the pharmacy or the near and dear ones of the patient as well so a lot of times someone may ask uh, so they had like if someone misses a dosage for example up to six hours after the scheduled intake so what you need to do is don't skip it still up to six hours still you can take it however if there's a BD dosage up to still 12 hours of the skip dose you may take it in fact as well however for the double dosage if someone has taken a double dosage so for example someone has taken an extra pill or the tablet so you may skip the next dosage actually and yes if someone has overtaken the drug you must immediately hospitalize those patients so what is the problem what is happening in uh, for the renal disease as I was telling so what happens is for the dabigatrin the important thing is it takes up to 14 hours the life is pretty long so uh, and what you should be doing is you should be having a good idea about the half-life and the plasma concentration as well so what tends to happen is if for a person with normal creatinine clearance the half-life is almost 14 hours for dabigatrin however it tends to keep increasing if the renal status is compromised it happens for all of them however for dabigatrin it tends to happen much more however, and similarly for edoxaban as well but for apixaban we are still waiting for the results or for the data okay so that is the reason why you should be able to decrease the dosage of dabigatrin immediately if you come across a patient who is really <laughs> as well and as we had already said it the bioavailability of this drug is one of the lowest for dabigatrin similarly there is a patient with chronic kidney disease as i had already said it 150 uh, for a creatinine clearance of 30 to 49 ml per minute 150 mg BID dosage is advised however if there is a high risk of bleeding one may advise only 110 milligram BD although for river oxaban you may advise 15 milligram OD I let it be uh, the creatinine clearance can be anywhere between 15 to 50 ml per minute When you are trying to use a NOAC in chronic kidney disease and there is clinical evidence, CKD can be a risk factor for not only thromboembolic events but also for bleeding. And creatinine clearance less than 60 ml per minute may predict increased stroke and also systemic embolus. 
and rivaroxaban has been approved for patients with CKD stage 4 with lower regimen but should be used with caution. Similarly, lower dosage of dipigatrin, 75 mg BD, has been approved by FDA but it should again be used with caution. So, chronic kidney disease should be considered as an additional risk factor for stroke in AF, but CKD also increases the bleeding risk. NOACs are a reasonable choice for anticoagulation therapy in AF patients with mild or moderate CKD. And NOACs benefit or risk ratio to vitamin K antagonists with rivaroxaban in renal impairment patients. So similarly, if someone is having a kidney problem, dabigatrin may not be the first choice as they are primarily cleared renally but may be used in stable patients. So in CKD patients, you should not ideally use dabigatrin. So this is one of the definitely the problems. Similarly, if the patient is on hemodialysis, don't use NOAX. In simple terms, I hope you understand. So there's a lot of uh, different things as well, what it should be used, where it should be used, and all. but I think you understand it clear, right? That it is better to avoid no acts, especially dabigatrin, if someone is on chronic kidney disease. And you must, that's why, if someone is using no acts, you should monitor the chronic kidney disease on a regular basis. And if there is a suspected overdose without bleeding or clotting test is indicated as a risk of bleeding, then you should consider coagulation test. And otherwise, if there is bleeding happening secondary to these drugs, for example, for dabigatrin, you should try to ch check for the renal functions. So, for example, if the normal renal functions, so once in 24 to 36 hours is fine, maintain good diuresis or local hemo hemostatic measures as well. They always, uh, the local hemostatic measures, fluid replacement, they hold true for both of them actually. So, if bleeding has already started, which is not life threatening for dabigatrin or for the vitamin K antagonists like the warfarin, what you should do is you may do RB subs RBC substitution, means the red blood cells you may try to infuse. You can also give fresh platelets, even fresh frozen plasma as well can be given. Or even for the factor 10 inhibitors, transoxemic acid can be used. And if there's life threatening bleeding, you may use prothrombin complex concentrate. In dosage of 25 units per kg. Although there is no clinical evidence similarly you may also consider using activated factor 7 for both the conditions but yes we all need to know there is no evidence clinical evidence for that for both both of them so in this slide all the things whichever i said it it's all well summarized in this so if a patient is plan to undergo surgical intervention or ablation so then what you will have to do is for dental extraction for up to uh, extraction of one to two teeth or paraborthic surgery or even incision and aperture implant, you just give a drip, drip, drip.
Now as well, hello. Yeah, now it is okay, doctor. Okay. So what you do is, just you have to skip only one dosage. So other than that, you can carry on. Same thing applies even for if someone is supposed to undergo a cataract or glaucoma intervention, or even for superficial surgery as well, like a abscess incision, a small small dermatological excision as well. So what about the bleeding risk? So bleeding risk, we should be aware that, for example, with a low risk, is associated with endoscopy with biopsy, prostate or bladder biopsy, or even for a procedure like a EP study or a radio frequency catheter ablation, or even angiography as well. However, high risk is associated for thoracic surgery, abdominal surgery, orthopedic surgeries, liver biopsy, kidney biopsy, even left-sided ablations as well. So that's why we have to be a little bit slightly careful when we are trying to use. So this is the dosage, I mean, and especially in the number of hours of gap which can be given for the special NOAC which is being used. So after the procedure has been done, when should the NOAC be restarted? So if uh, you are able to achieve immediate and complete hemostasis, within 6 to 8 hours after the surgery you can start. And if where you have to immobilize someone then again uh, within six to eight hours of the hemostasis you can start and if someone in a patient there's a post-operative risk of bleeding you can wait for 48 to 72 hours after the surgery and for patients like thromboprophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin it can be initiated six to eight hours after surgery and Regarding the recommendations for stopping and starting NOACs after air completion procedure, there is very limited available data. So, you should recommend strategy of bridging, for example, with well-timed pre-operative discontinuation as above and restarting of NOACs. And, and a too aggressively shortened periprocedural cessation of NOACs and or no bridging may be less safe when compared to continued vitamin K antagonist administration and ablation under INR of 2 to 3, both concerning bleeding and cardioembolic complications. And when a patient is undergoing an urgent surgical intervention, discontinue the NOAC. And you can wait for 12 to 24 hours after the last dose. And urgent surgery wherever when there is much risk of higher risk of bleeding than the elective procedure then you should be a little bit careful as well and you should strategize as well like what are the different things which is going on so i think over here we'll stop because in the next se session we will try to discuss in different conditions especially like the atrial fibrillation or in patients with the coronary artery disease and what about the non-valvular or the valvular AF or valvular diseases as well how the NOAX should be used can it be used or not how is the results we'll try to discuss in the next session so far are you all having any questions so any questions so far If there is any no questions, then we are going to stop it for today, actually. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, then. Thank you so much for having the presentation, Dr. Thank, Thank you. Take care. Thank you, students, for attending this session. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.